When people think about advanced economies, they will think of places like Germany, Switzerland, Norway and Sweden, all countries with a very high GDP per capita. On the opposite end of the spectrum there are underdeveloped nations like those in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, the Middle East and areas of Southeast Asia. There are all manner of factors that make poor countries poor and rich countries rich. Many of these factors we have explored in depth when we looked at economies like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, all the way up to places like Switzerland and Norway. Political stability, industry, natural resource wealth are all incredibly important variables. But there is something extra here that just doesn't seem to make sense. Cold countries are richer than hot countries. This is a bizarre correlation, but it is clear as day to see. This is a map of the world with colour coding for countries by GDP per capita. The poorest countries are centralised in the hottest parts of the world. What's more is that apart from a few outliers, almost all of the developed countries in the world exist outside of the tropics. So what is going on here? Is there actually a statistical correlation between the cold and prosperity? Could this just be a coincidence? And if there is a relationship, what could possibly be causing it? This episode of Economics Explained was made possible by our fans on Patreon. If you would like to gain early access to these videos before they're uploaded to YouTube, as well as participate in exclusive Q&A sessions, please consider supporting our channel on patreon.com slash economics explained. The phenomenon of rich areas congregating to the cold even looks like it takes place within individual countries. Take Australia for example. Its two larger cities are Melbourne and Sydney, located here and here. Logically speaking, the most prosperous city in Australia should be Darwin. It is much closer to significant natural resource wealth and it is significantly closer to trading partners like China, Malaysia and Indonesia. But it's not. In fact, Darwin is actually the poorest capital city in Australia, while also being the hottest. So since this theory anecdotally holds true at all levels, it's time to look at the data. No conclusive studies have ever been done on this subject, and in fact the only peer-reviewed paper that we were able to find on the subject did not actually look at any raw figures. This is always a really important step to take because sometimes things sound true when presented, but the results do not really match up. For example, it sounds like the average amount of arms for an American male to have is two. This theory would likely be supported by the anecdotal evidence that every American male someone would think of, off the top of their head, has two arms. But in reality, the average amount of arms for an American male is 1.998, because 2.2 people in every thousand have lost an arm or two. Put another way, most American men have an above average amount of arms. So, statistics is fun, and the results are sometimes surprising. Fortunately for the sake of this theory though, the data is actually very simple. We want to see the correlation between the average temperature of a country and the GDP per capita of that country. If we do a simple linear regression on this, we find a few really interesting results. As predicted, there is a negative relationship between temperature and GDP per capita. For every extra degree Celsius in average national temperature, the expected value of GDP per capita falls by $762 per year. This means that if country A is 10 degrees colder than country B, it is expected to have a GDP per capita $7,620 a year larger. When we do statistical analysis, we also look at a value called the R squared. Statisticians have a knack for making everything sound more complicated than it actually is. So what the R-squared value means in plain English is how much of the result is determined by the variables in the model compared to other factors that haven't been considered. For example, if we look at the correlation between height and weight, we would expect a positive relationship. The taller someone is, the heavier they tend to be. Using this example, we may find an R-squared value of 0.5, meaning that 50% of someone's weight is determined by their height. This would mean that another 50% is explained by some other factor or factors, not already in our model. 
In this example, it would probably be how uh, round they are. The relationship between temperature and GDP per capita gave us an R squared value of 0.09. This means that 9% of a country's prosperity is determined by its temperature. This sounds pretty insignificant, but it's actually huge. That other 91% would be made up of things like credit rating, natural resource wealth, infrastructure, government stability, and a whole range of other factors that people would expect to be far more important to the economy than the weather outside. So, the relationship is here, and it's pretty significant, but before this devolves into a statistics lesson, it is still important to address the potential problems, namely, the outliers and the cause and effect relationship. There are some significant outliers in this set of data. Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates and Singapore are all very rich and very hot. For the first three, natural resource wealth has overcome the inherent burden of hot weather. Singapore is just a genuine outlier that flies in the face of this theory. We would also be remiss if we didn't mention North Korea. It is very cold and very poor which is an example of political instability being a heavier burden than the apparent benefit of a colder climate. The other thing that is really important to look at when exploring economic relationships is cause and effect. Or rather, that correlation does not always mean causation. The classic example of this is that the sale of ice cream is very strongly correlated with drownings. Of course, Ice creams don't cause drownings, and drownings don't increase the sale of ice creams, but both of these events are more likely to take effect in summer, meaning that their nominal peaks strongly coincide. This might be a little bit of a dark example, but it shows just because something lines up doesn't mean that there is anything useful to be discerned from the relationship. This is called a spurious correlation. So, is it possible that the relationship between temperature and economic prosperity is just another example of this spurious relationship? Well, no. If this were the case, there would need to be an unknown third variable linking both of these factors. In the ice cream example, it was the summertime. People are more likely to go swimming and eat ice cream during summer months, hence the correlation peaks. Given that there is no hidden variable between temperature and GDP, it is safe to conclude that this correlation is not spurious. Okay, so now that the statistics are sorted, we have accounted for the outliers and addressed the potential flaws in this hypothesis, why on earth is this still happening? Why do economies not like it hot? There are actually a range of theories on this issue, but the reality is not yet conclusive. The most prominent theory is that of economic selection. Colder climates are very harsh during the winter months. In a country like Norway, people would not survive through these winters unless they planned ahead to stockpile food, build good shelters and reserve fuels like oil, coal or wood to keep them warm. From the outset, this gave these economies a head start. It wasn't so much that people were more industrious because of the cold, it was more so that societies that weren't industrious just froze and died off. A basic mud hut is more than sufficient shelter in tropical regions and food is available to hunt and gather year round. So there was not the same impetus to build larger and more engineered dwellings and become a society that valued storing resources. This kind of forced industriousness would compound itself over many generations to produce a society that values capital goods more so than a society that has had it easy throughout its entire existence. A critique of this theory is that a majority of particularly prosperous ancient civilizations were actually centered in warm regions. Ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Mayans, the Persians, all called very hot regions home. This should discredit the theory, but instead it actually offers even more insight. If we were to look at the correlation of temperature and wealth 2,000 years ago, you'd actually get the opposite result. Hotter nations were richer. So why did this change? It changed because global industries changed. 2,000 years ago, the wealth of a country was effectively determined by how much food it could produce. 
More food meant it could feed more people to toil in more fields to produce more food. Modern farming techniques did not exist, and even the most powerful empires would constantly struggle through famines. Warmer climates could grow more food and hence harbour more wealth. In the modern world, wealth is no longer determined by how much a country can farm. Instead, it's determined by industry and innovation. The societies which had been forced to adapt and innovate their way around a hostile environment for centuries could now come into their own and lead the world into the age of industry. Other theories also postulate that in colder environments, people are forced to be more tolerant of one another. If someone is going to be locked inside all winter with their friends and family, they are going to need to learn to get along, more so than people who are free to frolic about year round. On top of this, hotter temperatures naturally lead to more aggressive behaviours in human beings. Cold temperatures specifically do the opposite. Back in the age of conquest, heightened aggression was no problem at all. But in the modern world, dictated by business deals and global negotiation, the advantage definitely goes to the cooler heads. The good news amongst all of this is that cold countries got a bit of a head start in the age of innovation, but places like Singapore show that this head start will not last forever. Every country has its potential, regardless of what the weather is outside. Economic curiosities like the correlation between wealth and climate are truly fascinating. It might not show any information that could be turned into useful policy, but it is a great case study that forces economists to truly grapple with what it is that makes successful economies successful. Cause and effect is not only a driving force in economics, it's a driving force in the world around us. Being able to understand if something causes something else, determining to what degree it causes that something else, and then being able to explain why it causes that something else is the most important skill people can have in the modern professional world. Maybe it's a skill that can be honed while they're stuck inside for the winter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed the latest video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. This video was made possible by our patrons over on Patreon. If you want to have your say about what country or topic we explore next, please consider supporting the channel like these awesome people did. Thanks guys, bye.